All right, let's move on. Christian science. Christian science. There's a place uh, up on Wacker Drive, um, downtown Chicago, uh, the Christian Church of Sci or Science. The Christian Church Scientist. That's the way they call themselves. So. Okay, we're gonna we're gonna get going with this. Um, I've got today, and then uh, we'll have two class periods after today where we'll we'll talk about and look at the New Age movement, the New Age movement. So we've got uh, two major cults left. So uh, Mary Baker Eddy, she's the main name behind the Christian Science movement and uh, her writings and so on. So let's uh, pray as we get into this uh, cult today, the Christian science movement. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for the day. Help us as we uh, study these things this, uh, t this afternoon to have the truth in our hearts. Lord, I pray that the Word of God would be real to us and that we'd stand on it and believe it. I ask that you'd uh, bless this time of class in Jesus' name. Amen. I will read to you um, some things about Mary Baker Eddy. Uh, her background directly from the Mary Baker Eddy Library.org website. Okay, and this is what they say about Mary Baker Eddy. And this is uh, pretty, uh, as far as I could tell, uh, according, uh, reckoned with my notes, uh, very, pretty much accurate as far as her historical details. She, Mary Baker Eddy, was born in 1821, lived till 1910. So see, her Christian science and health helped her live to be 90 years old, or almost 90 years old. She was an influential American author, teacher, religious leader, noted for her groundbreaking ideas about spirituality and health, which she named Christian science. She articulated these ideas in her major work. What was it? Science and Health with Key to the Scriptures. That's the name of her major book, major writing. She published it in 1875. In 1879, so these are all later half of her life. In 1879, she founded the Church of Christ Scientist with a comma. Church of Christ, comma, Scientist. This today has branched churches and societies around the world. In 1908, she launched the uh, Christian Science Monitor, which is a leading international newspaper, and so on. She was born in New Hampshire. She was the youngest of six children, uh, Mark and Abigail Baker. Her formal education was interrupted by periods of sickness. And so she was very sickly as a young daughter, young girl. When she was not in school, she read and studied at home. She wrote prose and poetry from an early age. Her parents sought help from physicians for her ailments, but the treatments brought only temporary relief. She was raised in a very deeply religious congregational home. Okay? Any other great congregationalists you can think of? Mm-hmm. Judson's for a while, good. Anybody else? Try D.L. Moody, right? Yes, and uh, I'm sure many others. But uh, she rebelled against the Calvinist doctrine of predestination at an early age and regularly turned to the Bible and prayer for hope and inspiration. Oh, yes. In December of 1843, so she would have been 22 years old, she married a young building contractor named George Washington Glover. Not Carver. Um, George Washington Glover. And uh, they moved to the Carolinas. Of course, this is in 1843. It's uh, frontier. And uh, he died uh, the following June. So they were only married for about six, seven months before he died. <clears throat> and soon after he died, their, their first son was born, their only son. Uh, they had a son named George. Uh, right, she found shelter 
and support for herself and the boy back in New Hampshire um, until 1849. 1850, she was still having lots of recurring bouts of illness. And so she gave the young boy up to the family's former nurse. Um, and so she gave her son away. You know, I say away, give him to a close friend. In 1853, so she's 30-something years old. She's about 32 years old. She married another man. His name is Daniel Patterson, Mary Baker Patterson. Well, you say, well, what happened to Patterson? Is there another history of another man, you know, another husband of Mary Baker dying? No, this time he didn't die. He left her. He was an itinerant dentist who proved to be unreliable and unfaithful. He was gone for long periods of time at a time. And so she finally, and remember this is back in the mid to late 1800s. Divorce was very, very rare. And so he was gone for extended periods of time. He abandoned her in 1866. They'd been together, married for 13 years at this point. Finally, in 1873, after years of living apart, she divorced him on the grounds. Back then, you had to have real grounds for divorce. And she uh, divorced him on grounds of desertion that he left her. Okay, so she's been married twice now. First one died, the second one's divorced from her. She's still struggling with chronic illness compounded by personal loss, and she's preoccupied with questions of health. Like many in her day, she avoided the harsh treatments of conventional 19th century medicine. What are some of the harsh medicines or methods in the mid-1800s? <laughs> Amputation, right? That's an easy answer. Thy hand offend thee, cut it off. Okay, what else? Yes? Uh, lots of weird things. That's one. Yes? Uh, I know at the time there was, they were still using like heavy metals for some things. They would have like, like a dose of magnesium and stuff like that. Sure, I've heard of that. Um, something, I don't know exactly what it was. It was hydro something what they did with water. And I'm not sure exactly what that meant. But they also, bloodletting was still common. Anyway. So she was uh, not going into all those things. She's rejecting that, and she's trying to learn some new methods. Anyway, so she sought relief in various alternative treatments of the day. Diets, certain kinds of diets and oils and, and uh, hydropathy, some kind of a water cure. <clears throat> she studied homeopathy in depth and became intrigued by its emphasis on diluting drugs to the point where they all but disappear from the remedy. She experimented with unmedicated pellets. Placebos is something like that it's called. Concluded that a patient's belief, belief plays a powerful role in the healing process. Ha uh ha, -huh, now here we go. This, this is the, the science, supposed science now of your belief is what actually heals you. <clears throat> okay. While, while investigating such new cures, she continued to seek comfort and insights in the Bible, still drawn by the healing record contained in its pages. What kind of healing record do we find in the Bible? Yes? Yes? Okay, think of prophets, you think of uh, some of the early apostles, and of course Christ, a lot of healing with Christ. And so uh, those are the records that we have in the Bible of healings. Well, she believed that these healings not just are meant to continue, but that these healings in reality are kind of a natural thing, that it can, it can be repeated over and over. It's just Christ tapped into the natural thing, the natural healing. 
and that we can as well. It wasn't a divine miracle that only some, that's something that only God can do. She said, well, look, see, the, the apostles also tapped into this healing process. Okay. <clears throat> In 1862, uh, where were we at before that? Of course, we mentioned the divorce in 1873, but going back to 1862, this is while she's still married to this uh, Patterson. Um, anyway, in 1862, during the Civil War, she sought help from a popular healer in Portland, Maine. His name, Phineas Quimby. Phineas Quimby. <clears throat> Pretty much spelled like it sounds. Phineas Quimby. He's a healer. This is the 1860s. <laughs> okay, there's, there weren't many uh, TV preachers at the time, but if there was a TV at the time, he would have been on it. He's uh, that kind of guy. Her health initially improved radically under his treatment. This treatment that he gave to her included a combination of mental suggestion and what now would be called therapeutic touch. Okay. Um, by the way, modern medicine is heading this way big time. We'll see this even more when we get into the New Age movement. Uh, the effect of the New Age movement, uh, the, the prints, the handprints of the New Age movement are on every aspect of our society, and especially on medicine. One of those aspects is medicine. So anyway, therapeutic touch. <clears throat> get this. She, uh, her health improved immediately under his treatment, but as soon as she, she left, she relapsed back into these chronic illnesses. So she returned to Quimby, not only for treatment, but also to learn more about his approach. She thought and believed that his approach was the key. Not what he did to her, but his approach, his positive approach. Thinking that he had rediscovered a divine healing method, she spent hours discussing and exchanging ideas with him. She concluded that his technique depended larger, largely on his vigorous personality and his training in hypnosis rather than some divine principle. Okay, so Phineas Quimby is a healer. And she learns and believes through his work and through his healing that it really wasn't divine. What it was more so was his personality, his hypno hyp hyp hypnotic powers. There we go. Okay, so we're not talking about even some divine principle. She believed that it was a natural thing to be healed. You could be healed by tapping into some natural causes. All right, in 1866, you, I think you answered some questions about this, did you not? Yes, you did. Okay, so you already had a little bit of a background, if not plenty on this. In 1866, she fell on an icy sidewalk, and she was in bed in critical condition. She claimed, <laughs> she claimed, let me make sure and add that in there. Quimby had just died, and, and so she couldn't turn to him for help, so she said that she turned to the Bible. And while reading an account of healing, found herself suddenly completely well. And so she claimed that from that time on, that that was her healing experience. She had discovered Christian science, 1866. Mary Patterson, known as Mary Baker Eddy, could not explain to others what had happened, but she knew it was the result of what she had read in the Bible. Her conviction grew in the coming weeks and months as setbacks were met with even stronger proofs of spiritual healings. In uh, 1875, she published The Science and Health for the first time, and in this book she marked out what she understood to be the quote-unquote science behind the healing method. The healing works of Jesus, she claimed, were divinely natural and repeatable. Uh, 
All right. So today, if you want to see the headquarters for the Christian Science Movement, you can go to Boston, Massachusetts. Uh, she was buried uh, right outside Boston at Cambridge. And um, she, anyway, and you can go there and, and read about this uh, history and uh, so on. That's the main uh, headquarters for it. Okay, uh, one more thing, actually, as far as her background. 1877, she remarried again. 1877, she married Asa Gilbert Eddy, or Edie. If it's ice cream, I'm all for it. Edie's. <clears throat> Mary Baker Eddy. Asa Gilbert Eddy. He was a Christian science uh, practitioner, a follower of hers, a student really of hers, and uh, she ended up marrying him. Uh, let's see here, by this time she would have been uh, 55 years old already. <clears throat> when uh, Asa, he died before her as well, <laughs> uh, when he died in 1882 of heart disease, she said, that he had actually died of mentally administered arsenic poisoning. He died of arsenic poisoning, and he got it through mental ad administration. Right there. All right. All right. Uh, Mary Baker Eddy, she died December 3rd, 1910. She told her followers to tell people that she had been mentally murdered. The Christian Science Church today is run by a board of directors. And uh, according to bylaws uh, taken from Mary's own writings, the board today is still run that way. She wrote down the rules for the administration of that church because she couldn't get uh, the mainline Christian denominations to accept her teachings and her writings. So she finally decided to start her own church. Well, anyway, uh, the church today, if you can call it that, the group today is still run by the bylaws that she put in place. And she claimed that her writings were unchangeable. Unchangeable. Well, the Bible claims, of course, to have that uh, authority of being unchangeable. But uh, she put her own writings in the same level as the Bible. There's no preaching in their churches. Only lectures. Okay, so if you want to go to the Christian Science, the Church of Christ Scientist Church in Chicago, you won't go in there and hear a message. You'll, if, you, if you hear anything, it'll be a lecture. Most of the time, there are no lectures. Most of the time, you just go there and read and meditate. So, I don't know if they put yoga mats in there or what the deal is, you know. It's possible. Okay. Any questions so far? That's her background. I can, I can post that or you can look it up yourself on uh, Mary Baker Eddy Library.org. Uh, that's where I, most of what I just read to you um, comes from that website. Okay, let's then secondly talk about the sources of authority. We looked at her history and some of the background of the Church of Christ scientist. It, it hurts me to call it a church, but cult. There we go. Um. I want to next then look at the sources of authority that they claim, and then we'll look at some of their doctrines that they claim to believe. The sources of authority. <clears throat> Mary Baker Eddy claimed that the Bible was her only authority, but so did Charles Taz Russell and Joseph Smith and who's, uh, William Miller, and uh, I'm, I'm missing a name here. Ellen G. White. There we go. E.G.W. Uh, they all claimed the Bible as their authority. Mary, Big er, Ma er, Mary, Mary, Mary said, The Bible has been my only authority. I have no other guide in the straight and narrow way of truth. 
In following their leading of scientific revelation, the Bible was my only textbook. That's taken from Science and Health, uh, page 126. So she claimed to believe the Bible. She also, uh, she's believed by Christian scientists to have received her insights through divine revelation. So the Bible through divine revelation. Of course, Paul said in Galatians chapter 1 that he wasn't taught it by the apostles uh, nor was he given to it from other men, but he was taught from the revelation of Jesus Christ. Well, Mary Baker Eddy had to match that. So she said in Science and Health, page 110, No human pen nor tongue taught me the science contained in this book. No human pen or tongue. She also said, same book, page 107, by the way, I probably shouldn't... It's all, almost all of these are from that book, yes, Science and Health. In the year 1866, that's the year she fell on the icy sidewalk and, and so on and was healed of that a little bit later after that. By the way, does anybody remember what, what uh, were some problems with that story? That she fell on the sidewalk and she was about to die and then she was healed all of a sudden. Yes? Uh, the physician that did actually treat her uh, said under oath that she was never in any danger of actually dying. Absolutely. There's one huge uh, factor that's not mentioned in her writings. Anybody, I think, that's the main one I always remember. Does anybody else remember something else about that? Yes? Uh, also, in a letter that she wrote to someone at that time, she tried to like put it on the rest, but she wrote a letter saying that she was in good health and was going to be recovered soon. Yes, I, I, yes, yes, yes. I remember that now. Book, but then, uh, you know, <laughs> Then she almost died, then she recovered. So. Yes, so she had to make it sound very dramatic in order for a true healing to take place. <clears throat> in the year 1866, I discovered the Christ science or divine laws of life. See, healing isn't divine, miraculous uh, nature. It's just a divine law of nature. It's supposed to happen this way. You do certain things and you're going to be healed. That's the, yes, it's divine and that God set it up this way, but it's not anything miraculous that takes place at the moment of healing. In the year 1860, I discovered the Christ science, the divine laws of life, truth and love, and named my discovery Christian science. God had been graciously preparing me for, during many years of her illnesses for the reception of this final revelation of the absolute divine principle of scientific mental learning. Let me untwist my tongue after that one. All right, so she claimed divine revelation. Her book, Science and Health, is recognized by Christian science as their final authority. They claimed her book as a final authority. Okay, that's a, we have, of course, surely you have a problem with that. In Boston, uh, sorry, in a, in a book uh, put out by the Christian Science Church from Boston in 1941, the book is called The First Church of Christ, Scientist, and Miscellany. Not miscellaneous, miscellany. Yes? What's the full name of that book? Okay, the original one, Science and Health with Key to the Scriptures. In that book come out, that came out in 1941, remember I said that they say that her writing, the book Science and Health, Key to the Scriptures, that that is their final authority. In this book in 1941, it says, quote, A Christian scientist requires my work Science and Health for his textbook, and so do all his students and patients. Why? First, because it is the voice of truth to this age. See, the Bible's outdated, really. You, you need the science and health book for this age. Well, that's what Charles Taz Russell also said, for this age. That's what Joseph Smith said, it's for this age. That's their cop-out to get around the, the scriptures that say, don't add to this word or take away from it, or you're, you know, uh, anathema. It's the voice of truth to this age and contains the full statement of Christian science or the science of healing through the mind. 
So that's the first reason a Christian scientist has to have science and health. Second reason, because it was the first book known containing a thorough statement of Christian science. It's the first book known. Oh yes, it's the only book known. Um, Hence, it gave the first rules for demonstrating this science and registered the revealed truth uncontaminated by human hypothesis. See, it's uncontaminated with human thinking. It's divine. Where did it come from? Mary. (laughs) Mary Baker. So this elevates her book above all writings, including in the Bible. Okay, now I'm not done yet. She claims the Bible is her final source of authority, but then she lifts this book, Science and Health, up. I got another problem. Here's another thought. In her book, she often corrects the Bible openly. She often corrects the Bible. Science and Health, page 139. Listen to this. Quote, The decisions by vote of church councils as to what should and should not be considered holy writ W-R-I-T, that's Holy Scripture. In the determination of the church councils by vote, we decide what should and should not be part of Holy Scriptures. There you go. The manifest mistakes in the ancient versions. The 30,000 different readings in the Old Testament. And the 300,000 in the New Testament. These facts show how a mortal and material sense stole into the divine record with its own hue, darkening to some extent the inspired pages. Oh, yes. You just blow the scriptures out of the water by claiming that it's just completely chuck full of mistakes. And who decided that? The vote of the church council, the Church of Christ Scientist Council. And then in the same page, same uh, column going on down, it says, it has this phrase, that Christian science is unerring and divine. Oh, so the Bible is completely full of mistakes. Everybody knows that. These facts, this is fact that the Bible is full of, full of mistakes. I mean, the ancient versions have thousands of mistakes and all kinds. Of, there's all kinds of problems. But this book, Christian Science or Science and Health, is unerring and divine. There you go. So they claim to believe the Bible, but we don't really have the Bible because the Bible is full of mistakes. So while the Bible is full of falsehoods, her writings are without error, according to her. Okay. Yes. Um, was the Westcott Report uh, text published at that time, or was that? It had just been, it had just not, just been before, not long before that. Do you think that really like, played into Absolutely. that? Absolutely. Absolutely. Most, uh, you know, 1860s, 1870s did more to destroy faith in the Word of God than I'm convinced in any time in human history. Because of not just them, but the whole, the whole, uh, you know, evolution, and and then the attacks on the scriptures. I mean, people's faith in the Word of God. You know, people did. Now we have answers for it because we've had time to think about it. You know, that just blindsided most Christians. And so, if you weren't a strong Christian, I mean, you would be washed away with it. Typically, I mean, that just shook the faith, shook the foundations of. Many, many churches. Did you have a question or something? Or a point? Somebody raised a hand, I thought. Okay. Here's a couple of other things as far as what they say about the Bible, and then they attack the Bible. They say that the historical content of the Bible isn't necessarily true. Oops. <laughs> so here's, here's another quote from uh, Science and Health. The material record of the Bible, that means the history and the the factual you know, numbers and all that kind of stuff that you read about in the Bible and genealogies, the historical records in the Bible. The material record of the Bible is no more important to our well-being than the history of a... Then or there, I've got a misprint here, I think. Than the history of Europe and America, but the spiritual application bears upon our eternal life. 
what, what it's saying is that the, uh, the physical records aren't really that important because they're off anyway. The spiritual application is what's important. Here's another quote. I'll be done hammering this dead horse. The literal rendering of the scriptures makes... This is from Science and Health. The literal rendering of the scriptures makes them nothing valuable, but often is the foundation of unbelief and hopelessness. It does the opposite for me. When I literally understand the Bible to be factual, according exactly to what it says, that's not a source of hopelessness and unbelief to me. They're the ones who have unbelief and hopelessness because they don't stand on the Word of God. The metaphysical, then it goes on to say, the metaphysical rendering is health and peace and hope for all. So the Bible isn't supposed to be historical, accurate, factual for us. It's not those things that matter. That, that's not what makes the Word of God valuable, they say. It's the metaphysical rendering of Scripture that gives us health and peace and hope. Okay. So, they claim to believe the Bible. That's their source of authority. In reality, their book, Science and Health, completely trashes the Bible and corrects the Bible, and that is the true answer. That's, that's what they actually teach. Okay, let's talk now about the doctrines of the Christian science movement. Some of the main doctrines we're going to look at. Uh, one, two, three, four, five, six. We're going to go rather quickly. Um, I mentioned uh, Science and Health. That's her main book that she uh, wrote. The, the Church of Christ Scientists Church, cult, they, they have their miscellaneous books to, to discuss their beliefs. And there's not a lot of them, but there are some. And so I'll reference sometimes the miscellaneous writings. Those are from uh, the writings of the church. <clears throat> so these are generally pretty basic denials about common doctrines found in Scripture. Uh, first of all, Matter. What, is, what, is, uh, what do they teach about matter? <clears throat> is it boring or what? Matter. So foolish to me. Okay, just the Bible, you know. <laughs> what does the Bible say about matter? The Bible says it's a body and a soul and a spirit. <laughs> okay, it's a whole lot more simple just to believe the Bible. Yes, what does it say about matter? It does not really exist. And sorry, I cut you off. It's all mental. It's all mental. So if you die, you are mentally murdered. If you're sick, if you're sick, it's because it's in your head. You're sick in the head. <laughs> if, you, if you get well, it's because it's in your mind. You made yourself well. You, you know, you use the, the powers of the scripture and the powers of your positive thinking to make yourself well. Well, I guess I'm sick in the head. <laughs> <laughs> Are you sick in the head right now? No. <clears throat> Miscellaneous Writings, page 21. I I'm going to read a decent amount to you. And, and, yeah, some. My first plank in the platform of Christian science is as follows. There is no life, truth, intelligence, nor substance in matter. Nothing. All is infinite mind and its infinite manifestation. For God is all in all. See? God is all in all. Spirit is immortal truth. Matter is mortal error. Spirit is the real and eternal. Matter is the unreal and temporal. Well, God is spirit and God is all in all. But he made us to be matter. Okay. In the Glossary of Science and Health, the definition of matter in their book, Science and Health, matter. Look up the glossary and see what it says. Here's what it says. It defines it. Matter, the opposite of truth, the opposite of spirit, the opposite of God, that of which immortal mind 
takes no cognizance. It, the immortal mind doesn't even recognize matter. It takes no cognizance. That which mortal mind sees, feels, hears, tastes, and smells only in belief. If you see something, if you feel something, it's because you believe you see it. You believe you feel it. So if you're sick, stop believing it. And you'll be better. You'll, you'll just know that you're healed. Matter is an illusion of the mind. So where does evil fit in? Where does sin fit in? Okay, where does evil and sin fit in? Science and health. That's the answer for everything. So let's go 472, page 472. All reality is in God and His creation. That which He creates is good and He makes all that is made. Therefore, the only reality of sin, sickness, or death is the awful fact that unrealities seem real to human erring belief until God strips off their disguise. He takes sin and death and evil and strips off their disguise and changes them to good. Evil is an illusion of the mind. Sin is an illusion of the mind. Death is an illusion. In the glossary, that same glossary in Science and Health, the word death, here it's defined as this, an illusion, the lie of life in matter, the unreal and untrue. Yep, you're living in an unreal <laughs> existence if you believe that. <laughs> disease, same thing. Causes of disease are mental and our delusion of false belief. Haven't you seen this? By the way, this, this mentality, whew, I hate even thinking of that word now, this mentality is, is uh, pre, uh, preeminent, not, it's prevalent, there it is, my word. it's prevalent in the modern healing industry on TV, and I use those words on purpose, it's a healing industry. They make a lot of money. What are they doing? They, they encourage people to just believe in this thing. They don't even know what they're believing in. I mean, they're not believing in God, or they would do what He says. So they believe that they will be healed, and they, you know, and they get them to think positive and so on. It's, it's ridiculous. <clears throat> the cure for sickness. You want, you want to be healed? Yes, you want your foot to be healed? Here's your cure for sickness. It's to help a person understand that he's not really sick. His pain is imaginary. His imagined disease is only the result of false belief. You believe you're sick. You think you're sick because you feel a certain way. But you're really not. So just stop believing that. Start believing that you're well and you will be well. It's foolishness. Mary Baker Eddy. True. All right, let's move on. The doctrine of God. The doctrine of God. What do they believe about this? His being, God uh, to the Christian scientists, is a divine mind. A divine mind. It's all mental. Even God is a mental thing. Mind is all that truly exists. Now, here's, here's her weird way of thinking about God. Here's Mary Baker. May, wow, there I go again. Mary's idea of God. She said that God is all in all. That's what the Bible says. Okay? He's all in all. And God is good, and that anything good is the mind. So God and the Spirit who are all, are obviously mind. All in the mind. Life, God, omnipotent good, denies death, evil, sin, and disease. So don't let it be in your mind and you won't be sick. You'll be healthy. Um, this is a very pantheistic view of God. What's pantheism? God is in everything. God is in everything. The, the environment, 
Uh, the tree huggers. God is in those things. The animal rights. I mean, it, all of these things are, are really a, a form of pantheism. God is in everything and everything is in God. It's not really polytheism where there's many gods. It's just everything is God. And so uh, that's a form of pantheism. Of course, they deny the Trinity. Uh, the theory, this is um, the miscellaneous, sorry, no, this is uh, science and health. The theory of three persons in one God, that is a personal trinity. That suggests polytheism rather than the one ever-present I am. Science and health, page 256. <clears throat> and then it goes on to say, it goes on to say, if there is a triune person called God, it's life, truth, and love. Life, <laughs> truth, and love. So they don't believe in God. They don't believe in God. Life, truth, and love. That's the Trinity to this Christian science. Yes, live, laugh, <laughs> live, laugh, love. Uh -huh. Okay, by the I, I'm not going to keep hammering this idea of God, but, but they, they, they believe that God is not all-powerful then. Okay, God is limited. He's limited by our minds. Um, he's unable to foreordain things. He doesn't foreknow evil because evil doesn't exist. Evil is in our minds. Uh, as far as creation, God isn't a creator then. Because there create what? There is nothing. There, matter is a figment of our imagination. Yeah, I mean, pull out the shotgun, you know. Uh, it, it's a figment of our imagination. They say, so God can't be a creator. There's no angels. There's no real creation. God is all in all, so he could not exist apart from all and therefore could not have created all. Whew. Creation is the unfolding of the thoughts of God. That's what they say. Creation is the unfolding of the thoughts, the mind of God. Foolishness. So as far as matter, it doesn't exist. As far as God, it's all in all, the mind, pantheism. As far as man, man, the doctrine of man. Well, the Bible says that man is a sinful being. <laughs> man was created by God and therefore owes everything to his creator. Well, what do they say about man? They say that man has no body. Man is no body. Uh, Science and Health, page 475. Man is not matter. He is not made up of brain, blood, bones, and other material elements. The scripture informs us that man is made in the image and likeness of God. So we're all mind too. Matter is not that likeness. Man is spiritual and perfect. He is the reflection of God or mind and therefore is eternal. That which has no separate mind from God, that which has not a sing single quality underived from deity, that which possesses no life, intelligence, nor creative power of his own, but reflects spiritually all that belongs to his maker. So we're not blood and bones and brain and other material elements. We are mind in the reflection of God. So, only in the spirit, when the Bible says that we're created in the image of God, what they say is that's only the spiritual image. There's no physical or material at all in any way. Hey, if that's true, then man is not sinful. Okay, and that's the next point I'm going to mention. Uh, man is not sinful. Fall of man, that, that was all in his head. He didn't really fall. Yes? Still under the doctrine of man, the fall of man, the, sinless, the sinfulness of man, I guess. They deny man's sinfulness. 
uh, we become victims of illusion when we see or see other. I'm sorry, when we sin or see others sin. It's an illusion. When you sin, it's only in your mind. It's because you think you're sinning. So stop thinking you're sinning and you're just fine. Yes. Would that affect how they view like criminal justice then? Oh, I don't know. Okay, I, I don't know how, how much of an, an effect that has on the modern system, but I do know from looking at our modern system that if it's not from the Christian science movement, it's from a general New Age movement, that it's not that person's fault. I, I was talking more like the churches or diehard church members, cult members, uh, a view on it. It has to, but I, I don't know the answer to that okay, positively. So that's but that'd be an interesting thing to look up, find out for sure. Because um, I would imagine they would take political stands, mm -hmm. social stands, based on their beliefs like these. So like no death penalty. Right, so things like that. Right. <laughs> right. Um, what about the eternal nature of man? Uh, eternal, everlasting, I should say. Um, man's birth was an illusion. Man's death is an illusion. So therefore, man always has existed in the mind and always will exist in the mind. So obviously, well, when we get to the end, the state of man after death, which there isn't one, Right? There isn't a death, and there isn't... Anyway, so uh, they obviously don't believe in heaven and hell and things like that either. So, <clears throat> All right, Jesus Christ. What was the purpose then of Christ? Let's talk about the doctrine of Jesus Christ to the Christian scientist. Jesus Christ. They, they actually talk about Christ like he was here. Of course, Mary Baker Eddy. I got it right there. She, uh, she talked about Jesus' healings. So they believe in Jesus Christ as a person. But he was a mere man. You know what Jesus was doing? He was showing us that we can also do those same things. Channel, we can basically channel those healing powers to other people. That's, that's the purpose of Christ, was to, to, just like he healed people, he tapped into the healing process. And so can we. He was showing us that we can do the same thing. Yes? Um, this may or may not have anything to do with it, but I don't know if you know this, but you like pick up cards or something nowadays, and it's, you know, uh, it's sending, you know, warm thoughts your way. Um, yeah, whatever, yeah instead of saying like our prayers are with you, it's like our good thoughts are with you. Right. Right. Like, I don't know. I can't think of like specific, but I've seen some of them and it's almost, almost like freaky. It's like, why? Yeah. yeah. Oh, no question. No question. It definitely is. And, and that's also, and I, I mentioned already once, but that's also new age, mm -hmm. new age ideas of uh, channeling things along and so on. Um, there was there was an example I was I I can't quite come to it, but it's right there on the tip of my brain, which I'm sure I have a mind, a big one. Huh? <laughs> yeah. Can, can you email it to me? Zinc. M mail. M mail. Mind mail. Mental mail. Mental mail. Oh, we got to come up with something there. Gmail and email, and now we got M mail. <laughs> how many bytes per second? <laughs> Depends on how fa how much time you have to eat, right? <laughs> oh yes. 
Okay, there's... Oh, the vibes thing. It's not the, the word. I'm trying to think, and they can fix this with the video. They'll fix it later. Um, I got to come to this. But anyway, there's... You know, like if, if somebody has good... Uh, oh, I cannot think of the phrase. I'll remember as soon as I walk out of here. But it's something that's kind of commonly said as a joke. You know, like when I get around you, I can just feel the... Feel the love, or that kind of thing. Feel the vibes. Positive energy, okay. Now, we joke about it. I do, you know. When I'm saying that kind of stuff, believe me, I'm totally joking. But at the same time, a lot of people actually believe that. Very much so. You know, like you can just feel the connection, connect. Okay, there it is. I think that's the word I was thinking of. Uh, that there's a connection when I get close to somebody, that there's just a good connection there. <laughs> How can you feel the love when you're only in mental? Uh, okay, so Jesus, they say, was, uh, was just a man. And he was an example in his healing, an example to us. That was his purpose, they say. They deny that he was incarnated for us, God coming down to earth. They deny the virgin birth. They deny his infallibility. He was fallible. That means he was, he was a sinner. <laughs> of course, uh, if he disagrees with Mrs. Eddy, Definitely then he's wrong, you know. Uh, was he deity? No. They deny his deity. They deny his suffering. They deny his resurrection and ascension. They deny his death, the substitutionary death on the cross. They deny that. So yes. So summary, everything other than his healings. Pretty much, pretty much. Good point. So the work of Christ was demonstration. It was an example. So they're basically claiming the only thing that gives an example in was his healing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Science and health. Because if he wasn't perfect, you know, but then the whole he was sin either, right? Yeah. But 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 we're sinners too. And and if Jesus could heal then we can as well. See, so, you know, and if we can heal, then Jesus could heal. So he was simply showing us that a normal man can do these things. It's not a, it's, that's the whole point. Healing is not a divine miracle. It's a divine, they call it a divine natural law. It's, it's divine. It's from God, but it's just natural law. It's just what happens. This is the process that you have to follow. You believe it. And you believe it some more, and it'll happen. It's a divinely appointed natural law, they say. Yes? So it's like any other scientific discovery, though. So Pretty like much. Newton, Absolutely. Jesus found, divine, found Jesus found it and demonstrated to us how we can do that as well. The only thing that she missed out on was making a lot of money on this thing. Okay? <laughs> I'm sure she made money, but she obviously... This, this concept is much more widespread than just the Christian Science Church. Uh, it's widespread. I mean, it's a multi, many, many billion dollar industry in America today. No question about it. Of positive thinking, that type of thing. Next, doctrine of salvation. Let's quickly touch up on this. There's no real need for salvation because there is no sin so if Christ had not existed, it wouldn't really have made a difference. As far as a church, there is no true church other than the ones who have found this truth. So that's Christian scientists. So there are no sacraments. There's no Lord's Supper. There's no baptism. There's no need for any of these things. So... They don't really have a clear, of any kind, a clear definition of, of salvation, you know, even of works. You know, how are you saved? You know, what are you saved from? And what are you saved to? 
So if you want to be healed and live a wonderful life and have a wonderful afterlife, then believe it. Just believe it. It's, uh, it's there for you to have. So there's really a very hardly, hardly at all any doctrine of salvation. No need for it. Doctrine of last things. The doctrine of eschatology in the last days. There is no such thing. There's no heaven, no hell, no second coming, no resurrection from the dead. And if you don't believe me, ask Mary. <laughs> you think I'm wrong, just ask Mary. <laughs> you, you say, well, I want to know the truth. There you go. Ask Mary. She'll tell you in her book. Um, they do believe that uh, in some kind of a probationary time period, which is funny to me because how can you have a probationary time period when you don't believe in existence of matter? Um, but they believe in some kind of a probation time period after death, a time of growth to reach a spiritual state, to go from a mind, a physical existence somewhat at least they have to you know it's always funny to me they have to say that there's some physical thing to it just like the the girl that you mentioned they have to believe that whether they want to or not they have to admit that but then they say that there's after death there's a time of growth to a spiritual state and that's where you stay so a time of probation uh, after death okay so Christian science uh, and again, let me finish by saying this and wrap it up. The Christian science church, Christian science movement, is not really a huge movement. It's a decent size, but it's not a big movement. But their philosophy and their ideas, their pantheistic ideas, are definitely widespread. And in other forms, other, uh, other avenues, they have become a very, very powerful set of beliefs. Um, and the more that we as a, as, a, as a country and the world, even I think the European countries, the more that we reject the truth of the Bible and so on, these kinds of things just really make us feel good. You know, like well, I'm, we're not really that bad. We're just searching for a better state. And so this uh, fits in, this philosophy fits in with uh, an anti-God philosophy. Okay, that's Christian Science. Mary Baker Eddy uh, claims to be Christian, claims to follow the Bible. So, couldn't be anything further from the truth. All right, next week, the New Age Movement. We'll pick up there.